Hello and welcome to the city of Milwaukee. Uh, this is public records training and uh, we are joined today by the state of Oregon public records advocate Ginger McCall, new in her position, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about herself. And uh, we are hoping to have a great training today about how to make a public records request. If you cannot see the screen here in the room, um, feel free to move a little bit over to the side since it is at an angle, whatever works best best for you. Um, also, for those in the room here, the restrooms are downstairs, and please make sure that you have signed in. Um, that would be great. And then for those watching at home, this is a, a live stream, and it will be available to watch later as well. So you're always welcome to view that later. All right, and I, my name is Amy, and I work for the city of Milwaukee in the records office. So I'll turn it over to Ginger. Great. All right. Do you want to I'm going to start this presentation off standing, but as you can see, I'm a little bit pregnant, so I might have to sit down at some point. Um, so just a brief bit on, on my background first um, and on this presentation. Um, first, I would love to have your questions, um, but I would prefer if people could hold the questions until the end, because I found that a lot of times the question that you're going to ask may actually be answered in due time throughout the presentation. Um, so if you could hold your questions until the end, I'd really appreciate it. Um, and because there are a fair number of people here, if we could limit it to one question per person, one minute per question, excluding the reply time, that would be great. Uh, we can make sure everyone gets to ask a question, and then if people want to ask a second question, that's fine. Um, I am always happy, however, to answer your questions via email or via phone. Um, I do have my contact information up in the final slide, so uh, you will be able to find it there. Um, and if you do have a question, feel free to reach out to me. Email is generally the best method to reach me because I'm out giving these trainings a lot. I travel throughout the state to try to do outreach, so it would be helpful to, to have email instead of a phone call because I'm often out of the office. Hopefully, I think this is working. <clears throat> All right, so I started off my legal career as a public records requester. Um, I worked at a small nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., the Electronic Privacy Information Center, uh, where I frequently made public records requests under the Freedom of Information Act, which is the federal public records law. Um, usually they were related to national security type topics, uh, government surveillance programs, those sorts of things. Um, and I did that for six years. Oftentimes we had to follow up with lit litigation in federal court uh, because the Freedom of Information Act, the FOIA, allows for litigation if the agency fails to fulfill your request or denies it um, unduly. So we would sue in federal court um, and those cases would often go for years at a time. I think some of the cases I was working on when I was there are probably still running now. So I did that for six years, and then I thought that it might be interesting to go and work for the government to see what the actual lay of the land was on the other side. So I went and worked for the US Department of Labor, where I was for three years, uh, and there I defended Freedom of Information Act lawsuits. So that was very interesting. Um, sometimes <laughs> lawsuits filed by the very same groups that I used to work on coalitions with. Um, but it was really useful, uh, and I, it was very helpful for me to see that some of the misconceptions I'd had when I was on the outside about the government. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor is a fairly large and well-funded agency, but still it has a lot of challenges. Um, it has a lot of remote offices, occupational health and safety, mine safety offices that are oftentimes understaffed. They lack the proper technology. Uh, our FOIA office didn't have access to things like e-discovery tools that would have been helpful to search emails. So there were just a lot of challenges that even a large federal agency has. So you can imagine the kind of challenges that a smaller county or city office might have. Uh, so I did that for three years before I was fortunate enough to be offered this position. Uh, and I was appointed by the governor last year, I think January, and then I was confirmed uh, in February, and I moved out here in April. And uh, after a two-week journey in my Honda Fit with my partner and three dogs, uh, I arrived here to start this job. So um, I've been running the office ever since, and I just hired myself a deputy, Todd Albert, who's back in the corner there. So if you call my office and you get someone who's not me, it's probably Todd. Um, so yeah, uh, that is a little bit on my background. And tonight I'm gonna cover both the FOIA and the Oregon State Public Records Law. They have a lot of similarities, but there are also some important differences. Um, and this is fairly comprehensive. I apologize if it gets a bit dry sometimes, but I wanted to make sure that you had all of the relevant details so you could file a request and actually get a good outcome. So first, got some clicker trouble here. 
Oh, there we go. All right, the basic rule. So the basic rule, this first rule is the FOIA. Um, except with respect to the records made available under paragraphs one and two of this subsection, um, each agency upon any request for records which reasonably describes such records and is made in accordance with published rules shall make the records promptly available to any person. So that's the basic FOIA rule. You'll note you don't have to be a citizen or even a resident of a particular state uh, or even a resident of the U.S. to file a FOIA request. Anyone can file a FOIA request. Um, this, however, only applies to federal agencies. Uh, the federal judiciary and federal legislature are not included in the FOIA. Uh, in fact, there are not really government transparency or public records laws that apply to those bodies. Uh, but this does apply to federal agencies. The Oregon state rule is every person has a right to inspect any public record of a public body in this state, except as otherwise expressly provided. So you don't have to be a citizen or a resident of Oregon to make an Oregon public records request. Uh, and this applies to state agencies, it applies to local entities. So your city, your county, your special distri district. Oregon's law also applies to Oregon's elected officials. Although you'll see that there are some differences in the way that they can treat public records requests. But this applies to elected officials on both the state level and the local level. So you have a city councilor, that person is a public body for the purpose of this law. Uh, though they may sometimes try to maintain that they are not, they are in fact a public body subject to this law. So you'll see in those statutes that there was, there was an exception clause. So the exceptions under a public records law are called exemptions. Um, and generally in both of these laws, there's a presumption of disclosure. The government is supposed to give you the documents unless there's some legal reason for it to withhold those documents. And that legal reason, that's the exemption. So under FOIA, there are nine exemptions. In Oregon, however, there are 570 plus exemptions. Uh, the legislature is still churning them out reliably every single session. Um, look for a few more this year, I'm sure. Um, there are a lot of them. I'm gonna talk about them, but I cannot possibly cover every single one of them in this presentation. We would be here all week. Um, but I am gonna cover the basics. Um, many of those Oregon public records exemptions are in ORS 192, but not all of them. So these are the FOIA exemptions. Um, briefly, uh, exemption one is classified material. In two is internal personnel rules and practices. Three is information exempted by other statutes. So that's a catch-all. It sweeps in a lot of federal statutes. Exemption four is trade secrets or commercial or financial information of a company. Exemption five is privileged interagency or intra-agency memoranda or letters. That basically sweeps in your legal privileges. So attorney client, work product, deliberative privilege. Exemption six is for personal information. Exemption seven is investigatory records compiled for law enforcement purposes. Exemption eight is records of financial institutions. And exemption nine is the one that almost no one ever sees anywhere. <laughs> Geographical and geophysical information concerning wells. So that one there, that, that is worthy of being included in Oregon's 570 because it's very specific and it's clear that there was a lobbyist effort that created this exemption because there's no other reason it should be there. Um, so notably, many of FOIA's exemptions are not absolute. If you can make a good argument, you might be able to overcome that exemption. Uh, many of them contain a, balanced, a balancing test and that test often involves making an argument that the public interest in disclosure justifies the disclosure of the documents. So it outweighs the confidentiality interest in withholding the document. Some of these sunset after 25 years, uh, compliments of the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. I have a question back there, but I've, if you don't mind, just so I can get through the presentation, at the end, I'll, I will happily take questions. Um, so some of these sunset after 25 years, um, not all of them, but the deliberative process privilege, that sunsets after 25 years, for example. As with Oregon's law, the presumption is always in, in favor of disclosure. Uh, and if you want more information about these exemptions, again, it would take a week to cover all of them really comprehensively. But there's a very good DOJ guide online um, <clears throat> at this URL. And again, I will distribute these PowerPoints at the end. Um, or you can just Google US DOJ FOIA guide, uh, and that should turn it up. It has a lot of very comprehensive information, including case law on these exemptions and when they apply and when they don't apply. 
So Oregon, again, over 570 exemptions. Um, though notably, there are 570 plus exemptions, there is not an it will embarrass the government exemption. So don't ever let them try to tell you that. Uh, that is not an exemption. Um, there are, there's a fair amount of overlap between Oregon's exemptions and the FOIA. A lot of them protect the same interests, like commercial confid co confidential commercial information or law enforcement information or legal privileges. Uh, those are all also included in Oregon's exemptions. And again, the presumption is always in favor of disclosure. Complements of the 2017 statute that also created my position, you can now find a full list of Oregon's exemptions on the Attorney General's website, and they are required to keep that current. So if you want to look at that list and peruse it, it's up on that website. If you want more in-depth information about a particular exemption, uh, the Oregon DOJ also has a helpful public records manual, uh, and you can find that online on the Oregon DOJ's website. Uh, and again, I will distribute this afterward with the URLs, or you can Google it. It, it should come up pretty easily. So again, Oregon's public records exemptions are not absolute. Almost all of them contain a balancing test. And that balancing test, this is designed to allow government officers to weigh various interests and make a decision about whether or not to disclose a document. It's supposed to create some flexibility in the law, allow the law to accommodate various factual scenarios. Um, oftentimes, again, it's a public interest balancing test. So they're weighing public interest on one side versus interest in confidentiality on the other. So there are two main provisions of ORS 192 that contain the exemptions, uh, but this is not an exhaustive list because there are so many of them. Most of them are scattered out across other statutes, but again, you can find that list on the AG's website. But many of the most frequently cited exemptions are in ORS 192.345 and ORS 192.355. Um, 345, all of those exemptions have the same balancing test. It's a public interest balancing test. 355, each exemption has its own balancing test that's baked into the text of the statute. So if you read the text of the statute, it'll tell you what interests the government is supposed to think about when deciding whether or not to disclose. So what is a public interest for the purposes of exemptions? Um, it's information that facilitates public understanding of how government business is conducted. It has to be of value to the public at large and not just an individual. And the Court of Appeals said if a government action attracts significant attention or controversy, that may suggest a heightened public interest. So if you've heard about it on television, if you've read about it in the newspaper, there's probably a heightened public interest in it. So that's the sort of thing that when you make an argument against an exemption, you want to cite that kind of public interest. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how to make those kinds of arguments. So there's an exception to the Oregon exemptions. Um, most of them do not apply after 25 years. So if you're looking for a document that's 30 or 40 years old, provided that it hasn't been destroyed, um, per a legal record retention schedule, um, then it would no longer be exempt unless it's one of these four classes of records, medical, sealed, custody, or student records. Those can still be exempt after 25 years. So fees, unfortunately, under both the FOIA and the state public records law, agencies can charge you fees uh, for processing your request. Um, for some requesters, this comes as a bit of a shock, but it is there in the law. Those fees, however, are only designed for the agency to recoup its costs. Agencies on both the federal and state level cannot make a profit on public records requests. They are only supposed to be able to recoup their costs at a maximum um, for those public records requests. Um, they can recoup costs for time spent searching, for time spent reviewing documents and applying redactions, and for time spent duplicating documents. Um, they can also recoup physical costs for duplicating documents, so the physical cost of copies or for postage. Um, agencies have to set forth the rates for these, for, for these fees uh, in either regulations on the federal level or on the state level in their public records policy. Every state, every body here, every public body here in Oregon is required to have a public records policy. Many of them do not. My office is working on that um, and hopefully working with them to craft something that is favorable for requesters. Um, but they are supposed to have a public records policy and it is supposed to be publicly available. Um, if you don't see it on the website, feel free to call them and ask them for that policy. That policy should contain information in it that tells you not just how to submit a request, but also what the fees are that you would be expected to pay for that request. Um, 
there's an effort on the state level to push for a uniform fee schedule. There's a draft policy that's currently, you can find it up online on DAS's website. Um, it's just a draft. I know that there are substantial revisions to that that are coming. Eventually, it's going to be published for notice and comment. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in public records issues, to weigh in on that. Um, it, it seems to me like these fees are often very onerous for people who are making public records requests. So this is a useful place to make your voice heard. Um, they will be taking public comment once it's published. Uh, and I've seen on the federal level, at least, that public comment does have a real opportunity to influence things. So uh, keep an eye on that DAS fee schedule and what's happening with that and feel free to comment once it's published for notice and comment. Um, these fees can be, as I mentioned, quite substantial, um, hundreds or even thousands of dollars sometimes. But this is a good moment when you get when you get a fee estimate, which every agency, if they're going to charge you fees over $25, has to provide you with an estimate first. They have to. They are legally required under both the FOIA and the Oregon statute to do that. At that moment, it's a good time to reach out to the agency and have a conversation with them about how to narrow a request. Um, I think one of the most important messages that I would have is to make sure that you create a narrow request because that's in everyone's interest. Um, and this is a good opportunity to reach out and have that conversation. So both laws allow for reduced fees in some scenarios. Under the FOIA, there are three classes of requesters. Um, the first are the favored fee categories. So that's news media requesters, educational requesters, or non-commercial scientific institutions. Those kinds of requesters only have to pay duplication fees. They don't have to pay for review, they don't have to pay for search. Then there are commercial requesters. Commercial requesters are, you know, your typical a, a data seller that's going to take this government data, repackage it, and sell it out to industry, or an attorney perhaps engaged in a civil lawsuit who wants these documents for that civil lawsuit. Commercial requesters pay for review, they pay for search, and they pay for duplication. And then there's everybody else, which is probably going to be most of you. Um, Everybody else just has to pay for search and duplication in a typical scenario. In Oregon, the standard is a little bit looser. Um, an agency may uh, reduce or waive fees if giving the documents out is primarily in, in the interest of the public. Again, this usually applies to news media. Um, there's pretty much no scenario I can imagine under which news media shouldn't get a fee reduction or a fee waiver under Oregon's law. Um, but I think members of the public can also sometimes make an argument. Um, if you're making that argument for a fee reduction or a fee waiver, you want to talk about the platform that you have to disseminate these documents. You want to talk about your history of dissemination or you know the number of people you can get the documents out to, the fact that the public is interested in it. Again, you've seen it in the headlines. This is a, a subject of great public interest. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to make those arguments a little bit later. But typically, this the Oregon public records law, the fee reduction or fee waiver would by default apply to the media. Sometimes others can get it as well. Both statutes have a deadline, and they're actually a fairly similar deadline. Um, under FOIA, there is a possibility for expedited processing. We'll talk about that later, but it's a very difficult standard to meet. If you meet that standard, the agency has to make a determination in 10 days. Every, for everyone else, for a typical request, agencies have 20 business days to make a determination. So it's about a calendar month. But they can claim some additional time if there are unusual or exceptional circumstances, like if it's a very broad request, if they have a substantial backlog of other requests that they're still processing, if they're understaffed, if there's something else going on with that agency resource-wise. In Oregon, uh, we did not used to have any kind of uh, deadline, but thanks to the 2017 change to the statute, now we do. Uh, agencies have five business days to acknowledge your request, which basically is just a form letter saying we've received it, we're working on it. They have 15 business days to respond or at least provide a reasonable estimated date of completion. That reasonable estimated date of completion was meant to be the escape hatch for agencies that are perhaps under-resourced, facing a very broad request. It's not supposed to be the default. Uh, the default is supposed to be responding within 15 business days, but oftentimes, you'll just get an estimated date of completion. That's the very least that an agency should give you is an estimated date of completion. 
Um, they are allowed to, again, take more time if there's a resource issue, if there's a staffing issue, if they have a backlog or they're dealing with a very broad request. So the first step of making a good public records request is similar to the first step of many things, research. You can, under Oregon's public records law at least, just fire off a quick request. You can pick up the phone and call an agency and ask them for documents. But there are some compelling reasons to actually spend some time on the front end and do good research and draft a good request. First, it'll save time, uh, both your time and the agency's time. It'll make the request be processed faster. If you make a narrow request that's sent to the correct agency, your request is going to be processed in a more timely manner. Uh, it's going to take less of your time on the back end too. Instead of receiving a stack of documents that's this big that you then have to review, you'll get a stack of documents that's this big that's far more relevant to you. So narrow request targeted to the correct agency is always a better way to go. Uh, it'll also save money. You know, if you, under both the FOIA and the Oregon state, state law, if you make a request that's very broad, and let's say it, it uh, implicates 15,000 pages of email documents, that's a very broad request, but certainly not the most broad request most agencies are facing, you're going to have to spend money for the time that the agency spends searching for those documents, the time that they spend reviewing each of those pages of email, and then the time that they spend duplicating them. So if you can narrow it down, that's definitely going to save your costs. So these are the sort of research questions that we're going to talk through here that are good avenues to look at before you submit your request. So first, is it a government document? Both FOIA and ORS only apply to government documents. They don't apply to personal documents. Um, you know, if I have a picture of my dogs in my office, that's not immediately a public record just because it's in my office. Probably not something you're interested in anyway, but just because something is on my computer or in my office doesn't make it a public record for the purposes of the public records law. It has to contain government business. It has to be a government record. Um, you want to look at you know, basic search avenues like Google libraries or archives and news media stories to try to find out if this document is actually a government document as opposed to a personal document or perhaps a corporate document. Make sure it's a document that's actually in the custody of the government is used for government business. So then you want to ask, is it a federal agency or is it a state agency? If it's a federal agency, you're dealing with FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. If it's a state agency, then you're dealing with ORS 192. And as we'll talk about here and as we've talked about a little bit, they're very similar statutes, but they are distinct in some important ways. And again, you want to look on Google, agency websites, news media articles, and when in doubt, ask the agency. Under the FOIA, every federal agency has to have a FOIA liaison and a FOIA officer. Those people are there to serve you. They're there to answer your phone calls. That's their job. Um, so feel free to call them up. If you have questions, if you don't know specifically what office to target your request to, if you don't know specifically what to ask for, or if that's the right agency, call them up and have a chat with them. Oregon, every agency is supposed to have, every public body under that public records policy is supposed to have a person who's assigned to deal with public records requests. Many of them don't make that super obvious on their websites. Um, but I found a useful resource is the Blue Book. And the Blue Book lists, at least for pretty much all of the state agencies, who the agency records officer is. That's a useful place to start. If you're looking on a local level, you want to work with uh, a city records officer or a recorder. Those are the kinds of folks who would typically deal with a public records request. So your next question should be, is the document already in the public realm? There's a push on both the federal and state level for a thing called proactive disclosure. Proactive disclosure is where a government body looks around at the public records request that it receives and the document sets that it possesses and tries to put things up online proactively before any more public records requests come in so that the public has access to those documents without ever having to make a public records request. Um, so Oregon has two big public, uh, two big proactive disclosure websites, oregon.gov transparency and data.oregon.gov. Those are great places to start. 
federal agencies each have their own FOIA reading rooms and libraries. Um, some of them might also have proactive disclosure rooms. Um, I know that the EPA and DOJ and some of the other agencies on the federal level are making a big push to proactively put their documents up online. So you want to check there first. What you're looking for might have already been disclosed. Um, some agencies also, when they process a FOIA or public records request, then routinely put the documents, those responsive documents up online. I know EPA does that on a quarterly basis. So you can find what, all the documents that everyone else has already requested and paid for are already up for free on the internet for you. Next question is, is there a public interest in this document? As we've seen, this is an important argument for overcoming exemptions and for getting fees waived or reduced. So you want to see from the beginning whether or not there might be a public interest. Um, so you want to include that in your initial request. Next, you want to ask if there are any public records exemptions that apply. Try to figure that out. I, I told you about the list of public records exemptions that are up on the website. It's useful to peruse that before you make your request. Because if you're going to make a request that runs squarely into an exemption, just because you may not get any documents out of that doesn't mean you may not be charged for the time that the agency spends searching and reviewing those documents and applying those redactions. So if you're going to run squarely into an exemption, you want to know ahead of time. Also, knowing ahead of time about the exemptions and doing some research on that can have a real payoff. Um, when I was at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, uh, we were very interested in a program that we'd found out about. The CIA was collaborating with the NYPD to do targeted surveillance of Muslim populations in uh, northern New Jersey and I think New York City. So we thought, well, that's interesting. We would love to get a hold of those documents about that collaboration because the CIA is not supposed to engage in domestic surveillance. In fact, they are barred from it. But the CIA has a very broad FOIA exemption. Uh, under, under Exemption 3, it's a statutory exemption that basically says that you can't get any documents about the operations uh, or staffing or anything about the CIA. But there's an exception to that exemption. And that exception is for CIA Inspector General reports. Once I found that exception, I thought, well, I know the Inspector General did an investigation into this program. I know there was a report that was generated as a result of that. So I targeted my request and I made it specific to the Inspector General report. And I actually did manage to get almost all of that report. There were some redactions, but it was a pretty substantial piece of work. Um, so I took it out and I think we got a, an above the fold front page story in the New York Times on that one. So it was definitely a worthwhile use of my time to look into that exception to that exemption. Um, because if you know that, if you know what the exception is, if you know what the exemption is, you can tailor your request around that. So the next step is actually drafting the request. Obviously, you want to start off with the addressee. Who were you sending this request to? Try to be as specific as possible. So let's say that you're interested in um, federal DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. You're interested in something that ICE is up to. ICE is a component of the Department of Homeland Security. Your request would be much better targeted if you're interested in ICE's operations to ICE specifically instead of to the Department of Homeland Security's central FOIA office. Because if you send it to Department of Homeland Security's central FOIA office, it's going to take them a day or two or three or five to forward that request on to ICE. And meanwhile, your request, the deadline on that, has been told. So it's just, it's just in, the, in the ether. It's just waiting. So you're losing that three or five or seven or you know, 14 days when the agency is kicking your request around trying to find the right recipient. So to the extent that you can find the most specific addressee, that's always better. Uh, a good place to look for where to send a request uh, under the federal statute is to FOIA regulations. Every agency has to have FOIA regulations. Uh, those are up on regulations.gov. If you do a Google search, you can often turn them up. The agencies don't always make them super readily available on their website, but every agency has to have those regulations. And those regulations tell you how you can submit a request, what email address to use, what physical address to use, what fax number to use. And it's important to comply with that, because if you don't comply with it, they may not fulfill your request. Um, so take a look at the regulations of the agency that you're sending to the request to. Um, in Oregon, again, you want to look to the public records policy. Most agencies at least have up on their website, if you're going to send a public records request, here's the address to send it to. Some agencies have a centralized email address or portal. I know that the city of Portland has a central portal um, 
for better or for worse, it's there. You can fill out your public records request via that central portal. Um, and you wanna, again, be as specific as possible and preferably have the name of the records officer or the FOIA officer if you have that available. So the next section is the introduction. This is, so, you know, we all know that most people don't read past the headline. This is the headline of your public records request. You wanna keep it brief, you wanna keep it specific, you wanna make sure that if someone doesn't read past this sentence, they're still going to get the essence of what your request is about. Because a lot of people won't read past that sentence. So, keep it brief. You wanna state the legal standard, which is either 5 USC section 552 or, or ORS 192. 5 USC 552 is the FOIA, ORS 192 is the Oregon law. Your name and or affiliation. Affiliation can be important, especially if you're gonna make uh, an argument that you should receive a public interest fee reduction or waiver because you're a member of the media. You wanna make sure you state your affiliation. The name of the agency you're submitting to, a one sentence summary of what documents you're seeking. So a good example of that is, this letter constitutes a request under ORS 192 and is submitted on behalf of the Oregon Times to the city of Salem, Oregon. The Oregon Times seeks documents containing the results of the city's July 6th, 2018 water safety testing. Very specific, states you know, who you are, what organization you're working for, what it is you're looking for. So if that public records officer never reads past that sentence, they're still gonna know what it is that you're looking for. So the next section is the background section, and this is really the meat of your request. You want to establish in this section that the documents exist, that this is the correct agency which actually possesses those documents, and if relevant, that there's a public interest in the documents. So if you anticipate that you're gonna bump into an exemption or if you're gonna try to ask for a public interest fee reduction or waiver, this is a good place to start laying the foundation of that argument. It should be well-written and well-researched, and whenever possible, you should use citations to legal precedents or to other government documents or to news media sources that talk about this document or something like it or this program. And don't be afraid to use footnotes. I don't know, I'm a lawyer, I love footnotes. I think footnotes are great. Don't be afraid to use them. Because a lot of the people who are gonna be looking at your request, uh, many of them will be lawyers, especially if you're on the federal level. Uh, and if you end up appealing it, the person who's reviewing your appeal is definitely going to be a lawyer. So the next section is the documents requested section, which is sort of a restatement of what you said in the introduction, although it may contain slightly more information. You wanna state specifically what documents you're looking for. Uh, be as specific as possible. This is gonna allow the agency to do a better search and a faster search. Uh, and be as narrow as possible. A lot of people think, and I thought this before I worked for the federal government, well, I'm gonna make a request for all emails related to X, Y, and Z thing. How hard can it really be to, to process that, right? I mean, I have a Gmail account. You all probably have Gmail accounts. You just type into the search engine and then all of your emails come up and this should be super easy. It's not that easy um, when you're dealing with a well-resourced federal agency and certainly not when you're dealing with a city or a county or a smaller government body. Most federal agencies don't have a centralized cloud email server, for instance. Um, so when I was at Department of Labor, when we received a request and I was processing that request as part of a lawsuit, I would have to reach out to say a dozen people and say, hey, we've received this request. Can you please search your email for X, Y, and Z thing? And I would have to wait for them, usually people with other important jobs, other important substantive tasks, to perform that search on their own. Uh, and that wait, sometimes it took months, you know, even when we were being sued, which usually kicks things up into a higher priority level, but so you can imagine where it was at when it was just a request. So to the extent that you can keep it narrow and you know, don't have an expectation that they're going to be able to perform a Google type search or have access to e-discovery software which allow for easy searches of emails and easy review of emails. You have to take into account the fact that oftentimes these agencies are working with antiquated technology and they're understaffed. So some narrowing suggestions, especially if you're dealing with emails, um, include a date range or specific dates. Limit email searches to specific officials. You know, you're probably not so interested in what, you know, a low-level federal employee is saying about a particular policy. What you're more interested in is what the high-level decision makers are saying about that policy, who they're meeting with, what conversations they're having. That's a targeted request. If you name three or four officials, these three or four people, this date range, this topic, 
that's going to make it easier for the agency to search for your request and to respond to it. Um, and offer search terms, but again, don't expect that agencies have access to some magical Google type search tool. And again, when in doubt, reach out to the agency via telephone. Um, call up that FOIA officer or FOIA liaison and have a conversation about the documents you're looking for and have them help you to narrow that. Um, or in Oregon, reach out to the agency records officer, again, in the Oregon Blue Book. So your next section is gonna be a request for a fee reduction or fee waiver. Um, as we talked about, all agencies can charge fees to recoup the costs that they spend. Um, however, you can request a reduced rate. Um, this should be included in the initial request. I have seen people not include this and wait for the agency to come back and charge them a fee estimate and then they try to argue in favor of a reduction or waiver. Please don't do that. It's just easier to do that at the beginning. Try to start off with that request. It creates less animosity and it moves things or move things along more quickly. Um, for FOIA, you want to show you're a member of one of those three favored fee categories. For news media, if you have a history of publication or an employment contract, citations to prior work, I will say or I will say that FOIA has a fairly broad definition of news media. So let's say that you have a blog. That's probably good enough. Um, <laughs> if you have, you know, ten or twelve followers. That's, that's, that may be good enough under the FOIA. So you try to make that argument. It's worth at least a try. Um, but FOIA, the courts, uh, and the agencies generally have interpreted news media fairly broadly, especially since the internet has started. So it's worth your while to try to make that argument. Um, an educational institution, if you're a student and you're taking a class for credit, if you're a professor, if you are an adjunct professor, you can try to make a, an argument for it being an educational institution. Include a syllabus or a CV or an employment contract, um, some prior ac academic publications or a research proposal. Those are good things to do as evidence. <clears throat> a non-commercial scientific organization, I'll admit, I've never met one of these. <laughs> and I worked in FOIA for almost 10 years. Um, I suppose that it's supposed to be some kind of a think tank. I don't know, like New America Foundation or Cato or something like that. Um, that's supposed to be swept in under this. But uh, it, it's not a frequently cited uh, reason for fee reduction. So that's probably not the one that you're going to try to make an argument for. Most people tend to fall into the news media or educational institution category. So under Oregon's public records law, uh, you need to show that the records will primarily benefit the public. So you can again include information about your history of disseminating information. Um, you can include information about your intention to take this out to the public. Um, so prior publications, print media articles, or blog articles, especially if you have a good demonstrated following. Uh, Oregon, I think, tends to interpret the meaning of news media a little bit more narrowly than the federal law. Um, so, you know, you have a blog and your mom and three aunts and uncles follow you on your blog. That's probably not going to be adequate in Oregon. Um, you want to be able to show a little bit more of a following, a little bit more of an audience. Um, but those are the kinds of arguments that you want to make. And you want to include information that establishes a public interest in this topic, prior media reports, investigations, etc. Um, members of the public can also sometimes get a fee reduction or a fee waiver. Um, it's worth making the argument. So I can't guarantee that you're going to get it. There's a lot of discretion that's built into Oregon's law, far more than is built into the FOIA. But it's worth a try because it can save you, you know, hundreds of dollars on fees. And there's more information, by the way, about public interest fee waivers and reductions in the Oregon DOJ manual. So that's also a useful place to look. So under the FOIA, you can request expedited processing. This is a very high standard. If you are not a member of the news media, which is someone who's primarily engaged in disseminating information, it is unlikely you're going to be able to get expedited processing. Um, you have to be able to show that there's a threat to life or physical safety of an individual. It's a high standard, so probably not something that you're going to be spending your time doing unless you're a news media representative, then sometimes you can make that argument. Because for news media representatives, all that you have to show is that there's an urgency to inform the public about an actual or alleged federal government activity. So that's a somewhat lower standard. Uh, and this is, worth, this is an argument that's worth making if you're in the news media. And notably, you have to sign a certification of the facts asserted if you're going to try to make an argument for expedited processing, and that should go at the end of your request. Um, the details of what that has to include would be in the agency's FOIA regulations. 
Uh, and then finally, your conclusion. Um, so your conclusion, you want to restate the relevant statute, include a reminder of the deadline, always helpful. Um, it's either going to be 15 business days in Oregon, or yeah, 15 business days in Oregon, or 20 business days under the FOIA. Include contact information. More contact information is better. As you'll see, if you'd like to go online and watch the presentation that I gave to the government, I emphasize to them again and again and again to pick up the phone and call the requester if they have questions, but they can't pick up the phone and call you if they don't have your phone number. So please do include that um, and include an email address and a physical address uh, and then your signature. So the next step is following up and this is a very important step. Um, I think we've all probably heard the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease or some variation of that. That is absolutely true in FOIA and absolutely true under public records law. You wanna be squeaky, but not too squeaky. You know, don't call more than once a week, uh, but do feel free to call to follow up on your request. Um, again, for FOIA, the FOIA officer or liaison, for Oregon, the agency records officer or, or whoever is designated in the public records policy. Try whenever possible to avoid adversarial situations. Um, I work with a lot of public servants on both the federal level, the state and the local level. You do catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Um, try to keep it friendly and collegial. Um, and I tell them the same thing. Try to emphasize that this is an effort, a team effort that we're working on together. You know, let's try to find a way to get these records as narrow of a request as possible in a timely fashion. Try to work with them, at least at first. You may find that some people are a little bit recalcitrant, but by and large, most of the people who are working in agencies as records officers are not super invested in the secrecy of the documents. For instance, they are not the people who made that substantive underlying decision that you're trying to get information about. Um, they're probably not even the people who actually have the documents in their, their custody. They're probably just that lowly person like me when I was at the Department of Labor, who's reaching out to a dozen people and saying, I need you to search your email. Please, 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 pretty please search your email. So, you know, that the records officer is not the person who's responsible for the actual search or for the policy decisions. They're just someone who happens to work for the government. So when possible, be polite and offer to narrow. Both the FOIA and the Oregon law allow for review of an agency decision, um, and this is important. So you can ask for review of an agency denial. You can ask for review because of undue delay. You can ask for review of the fees that you're being charged um, or the exemptions that are being applied, but make sure that you pay attention to deadlines. The federal law is fairly strict on deadlines, and those deadlines, again, you will find them in the agency's FOIA regulations, and they are highly variable. Some agencies give you 30 days to appeal, other agencies give you 90. But if you miss that deadline, then you've missed your opportunity to appeal. So Oregon's public records law does not include a deadline like that, um, although some agencies may include that in their public records policy, so it's an important thing to be aware of. And also on both the, the Oregon level and the federal level, they are supposed to apprise you of your appeal rights. So how long you have to appeal and where you can appeal to. So under FOIA, agencies have 20 business days to evaluate an appeal. Uh, each agency has its own appeal procedures. Again, you want to look to the regulations for this. That tells you where to appeal, how long you have to appeal, and how you can submit an appeal. Uh, and if you don't comply with those regulations, your appeal might just be kicked out. You might just not be able to appeal. Um, and under FOIA, notably, you have to exhaust your administrative appeal remedies before you can go to court. So you have no option but to file that administrative appeal with the agency if you want to eventually take the matter to court. So Oregon's law, um, also I will say on the federal level, there is an opportunity for alternative dispute resolution that's very similar to what my office does. Um, it's called the Office of Government Information Services, uh, OGIS, and it's housed in the National Archives. They provide answers to public records related questions and facilitate a dispute resolution for public records requests. So you can reach out to them if you're working on a FOIA request and you're having some problems. Um, on the state level, I provide alternative dispute resolution. Um, both on a formal level and also on an informal level. Um, a lot of what I do just amounts to calling up a government agency and saying, hey, I got a complaint about this request. Can you explain to me why your estimated date of completion is six months from now? Um, so sometimes that goes well. Um, mostly I found that it actually is very helpful just to be a person working for the government calling up another person working for the government. Um, 
there's kind of an adversarial relationship that builds up sometimes between the public and the government, so it's helpful for me as a person within the government to then reach out. Um, and I can provide that service to you if you're having a dispute um, over a public records request, I would be happy to, to assist with that. Um, the statute, my statute requires that if I receive a request from a requester for public interest um, or for a public records uh, facilitated dispute resolution with a state agency, that state agency has to participate in good faith. Um, there's no such requirement for local entities or elected officials, um, but for state agencies, they have to engage in that mediation process if you initiate it. So if I can't get you the outcome that you want, which does sometimes happen, I don't have enforcement capabilities, I can't make anyone do anything, um, then you do have an opportunity for a more formalized review of a denial um, or, or non-responsiveness or a fee waiver uh, denial. You can take your dispute to, if it's a state agency, you would go to the attorney general. So you appeal to the attorney general, they consider the matter, make a decision, and then if it's not an outcome that you like, you can take the matter to court. Um, and notably, the, the state agency also can appeal the matter to court. So if it's an outcome they don't like. If you're looking for records of an elected official, your only option is to go straight to court. Um, elected officials don't allow for any other kind of review. You just have to go straight to court. If you're looking for records that belong to a local government, city, county, special district, you know, school district, whatever, um, then it's the district attorney that reviews that. Uh, and if you get an outcome that you don't like with the district attorney, then you can take it up to the court. So here's my contact information. It's also on the final slide. Um, you can find me online. Again, email is the best way to contact me. I have my phone number on the final slide, though, if you'd like to give me a call. Um, I'm also here to answer any questions that you have about public records. Um, if you are working on your request and you want to run an idea by someone, if you want to have a conversation about how to make a good public interest argument, I'm always happy to answer those questions. So please do feel free to reach out to me. So for district attorney or attorney general review, there's a pretty short timeline that they have to do that. I think it's um, seven days. And notably, AGs and DAs can order agencies to show them the documents in question so they can make an informed decision and they can order the agency to disclose the documents. Um, the public body bears the burden of proof in that, which means that it, the onus is on the agency to justify its withholdings or its denial of the fee waiver or its uh, non-responsiveness. And if either you or that agency don't like that outcome, then you can take it to court. Um, and notably, under both Oregon's public records law and the FOIA, um, if you take a matter to court and you prevail, you can collect attorney's fees. Um, and those are quite substantial. When I was litigating under the FOIA, sometimes our attorney's fees would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, I mean, it, uh, our lawsuits would go on for two or three years. Sometimes it would be ninety, a hundred thousand dollars in attorney's fees. I've seen FOIA lawsuits that were two or three hundred thousand dollars. So it gets it gets quite steep for the agency in that instance if you manage to prevail at court. So your next step is drafting that appeal, and you're going to see a lot of this looks very similar to drafting your request. Again, addressee, you're going to look at the FOIA regulations, or you're going to look at. Um, if it's a state agency, you're going to appeal to the attorney general. If it's a local entity, you're going to appeal to the district attorney. Your introduction should be pretty similar to the introduction to your request. Uh, state that this is appeal. This is an appeal under the public records law. Restate the legal standard, who you are, what agency you directed your request to, and what it was you were looking for. Factual background, you're just going to reuse what you did for your FOIA request or for your public records request. Um, and that's, it, that's very helpful to the person who's evaluating that appeal. Those back, that background information allows them to know more of what the request was about, why it's important, what the public interest is. So you should include that in your appeal. You also want to include a procedural background, which is the date that you sent your initial request, any responses that you received from the agency, or the fact that you didn't receive a response. If the agency accepted or denied your request for a fee waiver or reduction, if the agency accepted or denied your request for expedited processing, um, and you want to attach any relevant correspondence to that appeal. So if the agency emailed you back, you want to attach that. If you had a back and forth exchange with them where you made a good faith effort to narrow your request, you want to attach that to this appeal. And you want to make your argument for why the agency was wrong. 
Uh, and again, this should be clear and well researched. Uh, you can look to the DOJ FOIA guide or to the on the state level the Oregon DOJ uh, Public Records Manual. Try to include citations, if possible, to cases, to regulations, to agency policy, to prior district attorney's decisions here in the state of Oregon. And make sure that you address all of the relevant issues in this appeal. This is your one shot. You can't file another appeal two months later. You should include all relevant issues in this appeal. So exemptions, search issues, denials, failures to respond, fee waiver reduction, fee, fee waiver or reduction denials, all of that should be swept into this appeal. So you're gonna to renew too, if you made a request for a fee reduction or a waiver, you renew that, reuse the language from your prior request justifying that. If it's a FOIA request and you try to make an argument for expedited processing, you wanna renew that as well. You could just reuse your language. Uh, and the conclusion, again, contact information, signature, try to be um, as comprehensive as possible there. So as I noted earlier, both FOIA and Oregon's public records law allow for judicial review and attorney's fees if you manage to prevail. So a useful thing to keep in mind, a lot of people are not empowered to sue, um, but if you happen to be an attorney or you happen to know an attorney who would represent you in a public records matter, it's a useful thing to do. Um, not only will it get you the documents, but it helps to clarify the law and set case law. On the federal level, there's a very robust uh, case law around the FOIA, which goes a long way toward clarifying the law. There's much less litigation here in Oregon, so there are a lot of ambiguities still in the law. So in conclusion, do you really have to make all this effort? Can't you just pick up the phone and call an agency and demand documents? You can, um, but you'll probably end up, it will take longer and you'll end up paying more money. So a little bit of research, a little bit of time on the front end, drafting an actually substantive request will definitely be helpful to you and it will pay off in the end. Um, and I have a list of feedback questions here. I would love to hear from you um, either now or you can shoot me an email. Um, I'm always available via email. I'm also on Twitter because that's where everybody is apparently um, and on Facebook. Uh, and I have a website up online where I'm going to list these trainings uh, as well as some other materials. So, all right. Um, got my mic wrangler here. Uh, and again, as I had said before, I'm happy to receive questions. There are a fair number of people here. Please keep it to one question per person, at least at first, and please try to keep the questions brief to a minute or less. Great. Thank you so much. All right, questions? Sure. Um, we heard about state agencies and federal agencies. Do our municipalities bound to the same standard or do they have a degree of independence? They are bound to the same standard. Uh, under Oregon's public records law, municipalities are included in that. So they would be included in the, the local bucket. So municipality, you can make a public records request to them. They have all the same obligations. And if you have to appeal it, it would be appealed to the district attorney. More questions? How do you make a definitive determination as to whether an entity is a public agency? And, and what about judicial and quasi-judicial? So the best place to look for information on that would be the um, the DOJ records man the DOJ public records manual. It should have more information on which specific agencies. Uh, would be included. Um, I mean, as a general matter, all government bodies are included. So, uh, you, you. if it's judicial or quasi-judicial, that I think that DOJ guide would probably be the best place to look. Or if you have a specific question about a specific entity, feel free to email me, and I'll do some research and let you know. Any more questions? Oh, over there, sure. Uh, you mentioned something about enforcement capabilities. I was just wondering who has the enforcement capabilities in these situations and um, who has the final say in getting people to disclose these documents? So the final, final say is the courts, um, but the intermediate final say is the district attorney or the attorney general. Um, the DA or the AG can order the disclosure of documents. Um, they can order agencies to show them the documents in question. Um, I don't have that capability. I cannot order disclosure. Um, I think that that was deliberate in the statute. My capability is to try to facilitate communication. Um, and <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, you know, I'd have to have much more of a staff in order to be able to do that. 
Hi, Ginger. Um, can you please explain uh, what happens when uh, the legislature goes into session? And um, I hear that their uh, public record requests don't apply, or... <laughs> Am I misinformed? So the legislature elected officials are subject to the public records law. Um, the only difference between, well, the major difference between an elected official and a regular government body is that elected officials, you can only appeal to the court. You can't appeal to the district attorney or the attorney general. But they are still subject in session, out of session. They are always subject to public records law. So a senator or a representative? State, state, yes, yeah, state level elected representatives. Um, on the federal level, <laughs> the FOIA does not apply to elected officials, unfortunately. Uh, they helpfully exempted themselves from that. Okay. Hi. And, and on a local level, if the uh, public official, does that state law apply here in Oregon? A local elected official is absolutely subject to the public records law. Although recently some of them have tried to claim they are not, it is indisputable. That is clear in the law. They are subject to it. And their past records as well that if they left office and they have files behind. Yes. To access those files that are left behind. Yes, you should be able to, but within the boundaries of record retention schedule. Um, so record retention schedules are lawfully set by the archivist of the state of Oregon. They allow agencies to destroy certain records after a certain amount of time. The amount of time can only be set by the state archivist and those record retention schedules are available online, I believe on the state archives website. Um, you know, some records are set for destruction after five years, others are set for destruction after 20 and some are permanent records, but it's only a small subset of records that are permanent records. I believe that can be found on the Secretary of State's website. Yep. Yes. And also on the federal level, the federal level, there are similar record retention schedules. Um, so it could be if, for instance, you're looking for an Occupational Health and Safety Administration inspection that took place where there was no <laughs> compliance problem identified. It was everyone was in compliance. Those, I think, get destroyed after three years, those inspection files. Um, if there was non-compliance, I think that's like seven or nine years. Um, so yeah. Every agency has a record retention schedule that should cover pretty comprehensively all of the documents that that agency would possess in its normal business. I have encountered a city of Portland senior planning person in the building department who is a bully. And I think I can resolve the issue and then go for a public request. Would you recommend it in that order? <laughs> or should I kick the beehive? So the question is, there's some underlying issue. She lied to me and she's a bully. And she's doing it under the cover of, you can't fight City Hall. I like this. And so I think I can resolve the underlying issue. I think it's not very big. But I want to go and be a journalist and review the people that she has beaten up in the past. And as a an honest citizen say, how was it dealing with her? And if I'm the only one, that's my problem. But if she has a pattern, I want to bust her. I think if you're worried about retaliation, it would definitely be better to resolve the underlying issue first and then move on to the like accountability for the processes that created that situation. So her judgments, the things that she has worked on with complaints are a public record. <coughs> um, I, I believe so, yeah, they should be. They may be subject to exemptions, but yeah, typically those would be, would be a public record. Cool. If you didn't make an argument for a fee waiver up front, do you have any advice on how to do that after getting fees? Um, I think the Oregon law is a little bit uh, looser on that. I'd say it's always worth a try. You know, you can, you can make that argument after you get the fee estimate. You're probably in a weaker position, but it's always worth a try. Just say, you know, I... I got this fee estimate. I'd like to ask you to waive or reduce the fee estimate for X, Y, and Z reasons. So, and you know, I mean, a fair number of agencies will be open to that. I have seen agencies reduce or waive fees because they know the person is is indigent or is in prison and can't possibly pay those fees. I've seen them reduce fees just because they don't want to deal with the bureaucratic hassle of trying to collect all of those fees and have arguments with you about it. You know, the, a lot of them will do it just as a matter of, 
of good business and sort of good human interaction and good government. All right. Uh, so 570 something exemptions in Oregon, that seems excessive. What is the process for making these exemptions? Uh, and what is the threshold for approving them? Uh, and is there any possibility of maybe reforming that and simplifying that in the future? Do you have a well-paid lobbyist? Then you too can get a public records exemption. Um, I mean, that seems to be the, that seems to be the requirement for getting one if you have a well-paid lobbyist. Um, right now, there is a committee that is reviewing all of those exemptions. It's a 10-year committee because it's a lot of exemptions. Um, so that's still about, what, 57 exemptions per year. Well, probably 60, because they're still creating new ones. Uh, the Sunshine Committee, which I would encourage you, if you're interested in government transparency and government oversight issues, to engage with that committee. Uh, they do frequently take public comment and testimony. Right now, they're considering very important personal privacy exemptions that actually have Im real implications for you. So if you, for instance, don't want your home address disclosed when you file a complaint with the police or with a government agency, it may be a good time to weigh in on that because they're considering whether or not to continue those sorts of exemptions. Um, so if you care about privacy issues, which you know, you're weighing against government transparency in this instance, unfortunately, now is a good time to weigh in. Um, but they are going to be considering, I believe, all of the exemptions over the next 10 years, at least that's their charter. Um, including government personnel disciplinary actions, uh, including criminal investigatory exemptions, um, including all of the exemptions that, that we talked about that are included in the law. So if you're interested in this issue and you care about it, I would highly recommend that you engage. Uh, because I will tell you, if you, the public, are not engaging, guess who is engaging? All of the lobbyists who created those exemptions to begin with. So they are there, they will show up, they will come out of the woodwork. So you have to be there on the other side to push back. So I would highly recommend checking that out. The next meeting I think is gonna be in late November or early December. And to clarify, that's the Sunshine Committee? The Sunshine Committee, okay. yeah. And that's a committee I'm not actually on. Um, I will be sitting in the peanut gallery with you if you go to comment there. Um, can I ask this question? When is the baby due and do you have a name yet? <laughs> Everyone asks me about the name. We don't have a name yet. <laughs> um, the baby is due in late January, which I hear for first babies means probably February. So, um, and I will be out of the office for a little while then, but Todd will be covering the office, so you will still be able to get assistance. Great, any last questions? I think there was one back there. Sure. Who should I contact about the Sunshine Committee? So the Sunshine Committee, the chair of that committee is Michael Crone. He's in the Attorney General's office. The co-chair is Emily Matasar in the Governor's office. Um, they have a website which announces their meetings. Um, and I think at the last meeting, they did take testimony from the public on these privacy exemptions. Um, they're probably still accepting testimony if you have an interest in those particular questions. Um, and you can find minutes from the meetings, and I believe recordings of them up online on the website. It's on the Attorney General's General's website. But if you if you Google Sunshine Committee or again Attorney General, it'll come up. And again, I highly encourage you to engage. Um, I also I am the chair of the Public Records Advisory Council, which is also a public meeting. Uh, it takes place approximately quarterly. And we're talking about legislative proposals to improve transparency. One of the things that we came up with is um, requiring annual reporting from state level agencies on how they're managing public records requests. Um, we're starting off with low hanging fruit. So how many public records requests have you received? How long is it taking you to process those? And whether or not, or, and how many fee requests for fee, waiver, fee waivers or reductions have you denied? So agencies will have to report on that on an annual basis, which I think will create some transparency, which hopefully will incentivize better behavior. Um, and we put forth that legislation, uh, so it is pending. So if it's something that you care about, again, feel free to contact your representatives uh, or talk to other people about it. Wonderful, any more questions? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so. I have a very general question, which is uh, if I'm talking to 
friends, people my age who are maybe not necessarily as interested in this process, and they say, well, what's so good? Like, why should records be public? Why should records be public? So a personal anecdote. Uh, when I started in Epic at Epic doing privacy, um, it was 2009, which was right about the same time that those body scanners were rolled out into the airport. Um, the body scanners that you see in the airport now are very different than the body scanners and the capabilities that they had in 2009. And the reason for that is public records requests. We submitted several public records requests to the Department of Homeland Security, filed a couple of lawsuits on it, and managed to get back records that showed that the machines weren't designed to detect powdered explosives, which were the big threat at the time, uh, and that they were designed to export very graphic images. So we took those documents out to the media. We got a bunch of stories, uh, <laughs> went on live national television and talked about the documents. And as a result of that, on a national level, agency policy changed. They had to change their policy. We formed a coalition around a lot of the things that we found out in the documents. We pushed for policy change, and that's the reason why the airport scanners now have privacy protections built into them. That's the reason why instead of a TSA officer in a remote room seeing a very graphic picture of your body, instead what they're seeing is a Gumby figure that you can turn around and look at actually as you walk out of that machine. So you can change policy with a public records request. Um, you know, I received other documents that we took to Congress. We got congressional hearings. I, there was a, a senator who had our stack of documents in her hand and she was shaking them as she was questioning the Department of Homeland Security's chief privacy officer. So you can really create policy change with this. I mean, to my understanding, it was public records requests that helped to bring down the last governor of the state. So. Public records are serious business and I think can create a real difference. Did I understand correctly that if it becomes necessary to litigate that you can have a peer pro pro something you need to know what Pro pro say, yeah. Um so I am not sure what the rule is in Oregon's law. The question was um if you litigate, can you appear pro se? Under the FOIA, you can definitely appear pro se, but if you're pro se, you can't collect attorney's fees. Um, you have to have an actual attorney. Um, unless you are, <sighs> see, I had a friend who litigated this and he actually won. Um, he was like a one or two man operation. National Security Counselors is the name of the organization. You can look up the case. Um, and he litigated whether or not he could collect FOIA fees uh, and the agency tried to claim that he was pro se, but because he'd incorporated as a nonprofit, because he had some other clients, they found that he was not pro se, he was an actual attorney and he could collect attorney's fees. Um, so under the FOIA, there's a little bit more room for that. I'm not sure what the rule is under Oregon law, but I believe you can still appear pro se. You may just not be able to get attorney's fees. Any final questions for Ginger? Great. Well, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have, oh yes, the contact slide. Let's do that. Um, if you have additional questions, if you want to give me feedback, if you think that this presentation was too long or too short, included too much or didn't include enough, please do let me know. I'm doing another public presentation in Portland next Monday. Um, so it would be great to have your feedback on the presentation. Um, also, if you have any questions ever about Oregon's public records law, I would be happy to answer them. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, and if you need dispute resolution, I'm also happy to provide that. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for coming.